embossing and foil stamping paper. Can any other process match them for immediacy of impact? For delighting so many senses at once? For making an image or a message come alive? When produced by master craftsmen, the embossed or foil stamped image is truly a work of art, requiring skill, dedication, and imagination, all of a highly specialized order. The die maker and the pressman must both possess not only mechanical skill and knowledge and a precise eye for detail, but more important, an artisan's imagination, judgment, and devotion to quality. Perhaps nowhere is this more apparent than during the part of the embossing process known as the make ready. If the counter die doesn't bottom out perfectly onto the die, if the heat, pressure, and speed settings aren't exactly right for the type of die, foil, and stock being used, if each machine element isn't perfectly positioned, then all the work of the designer and die maker have gone for nothing. This program will introduce you to the critical make ready process. The steps we'll be showing you are not the only way or even the best way to carry out the make ready. There is no one best way because make ready is not just a mechanical procedure. It's a craft. And because each pressman is an artisan who puts a personal stamp on his work. That's part of the joy of being a pressman. What we can show you here is a basic dependable method that will enable you to perform all the necessary make ready tasks with confidence. In short, we can give you a starting point for developing your own style and techniques as a pressman. If you come back and view this tape a year from now, you'll be surprised at how much you've changed the way you perform a make ready. But we think you'll also be pleased to see how solid a foundation on the basic procedures we've given you here. What exactly is the make ready? While carrying out the make ready amounts to doing everything that needs to be done to prepare the press for a run. While you will be making spot checks and adjustments during the press run, how well you perform the make ready really determines the quality of the finished piece. Make ready is a complex process involving many separate steps. Some individual steps will change depending on whether you are blind embossing, flat stamping, or combination stamping. But the procedure for any of these can be broken down into six basic stages. Let's take a look at what each stage involves. After we've done that, we'll watch an experienced pressman perform a blind emboss make ready. Back and take a closer look at those steps that change for a flat stamping or combination stamping job. For any job, the first stage is assembling your materials. These include the tools for setting up the press, the materials you'll need to create the counter die, and the particular job's stock, foils, dies, and artwork. Having everything laid out and ready beforehand will save you a lot of time and aggravation once the job's underway. Next is clearing the press. That means getting the press ready to receive a new job. You'll inspect and lubricate the press, move the magazine, feeder, and delivery out of the way, and remove the gauges, guides, and grippers until it's time to reset them for the new job. The third stage is setting up the platen and chase. Now is when you mount the die onto the toggle base, the toggle base onto the bed, and the die cutting plate onto the platen. It's also when you set the temperature for hot stamping. The fourth stage is creating the counter die. For some jobs, you may be using a pre-cast counter made by the die maker. But more often, you'll create your own counter die. Quick drying counter die mixtures simplify the procedure. And you can use the counter die for up to 100,000 impressions and at a variety of temperature settings. At the end of this stage, you'll make a test impression to see the quality of image you'll achieve on your finished product. Where the image appears is just as critical. At stage five, positioning the stock, you'll determine exactly where the image has to appear and set the gauges, guides, and grippers so they ensure that the image does appear in exactly that spot for every impression. Finally, setting up and running the press. The feeder, delivery, and magazine assemblies that you moved out of the way early in the make ready process must now be set up in the exact positions needed to handle this job stock. 
now is also when you'll make your final pre-run check for quality and position of image. And that completes the make ready. The press is ready to run. Now that you've been introduced to the major stages of the make ready process, let's watch an experienced pressman perform a blind emboss make ready. This job will be run on the Kluge EHD series press. But what you'll see here isn't limited to the EHD series. All Kluge sheet bed presses are very similar in their setup and basic operation. And you can easily adapt what you see here to any other Kluge sheet bed press. Any job should begin by laying out all the tools and materials you'll need. And make sure you have the right tools and quality materials. Using a nail file as a screwdriver or a piece of cardboard as a T-square is not how to show creativity as a pressman. And there's no more expensive way to try to cut costs than by using substandard counter dye mixes or cheap glues and tape. Quality tools and materials will save you time, money, and aggravation. For this job, we'll need first the tools for setting up the press. Kluge Automatic Platen Press Oil for lubricating the press, an Allen wrench, screwdriver, and 5 8 inch wrench, toggle hooks for attaching the die to the toggle base, T-square and pica stick for making sure die and paper are properly positioned, and an optivizer for examining the quality of the test impression. Next are the tools and materials for creating the counter die. Cut pieces of gray board and capping board to match the size of the die. To make the counter die, we need counter die powder and liquid, disposable mixing cups, and a mixing stick. A putty knife or any knife will do. For attaching the layers to one another, we'll need duplo fold double-sided tape, make ready glue, and some masking tape. A sheet of mylar release film keeps the counter die mix from sticking to the die. Cut the film slightly larger than the size of the die. Or you could spray the die with a non-stick spray. We'll need a cleanup knife to clear away excess counter die material. And a make ready knife to carve out the portions of the counter die that we don't want to impress the stock. And we'll need a filled water spray bottle to moisten the capping board before carving. Finally, Gather the materials specific to this job. The artwork, which may be a key line, sometimes called a mechanical, or a sample of a finished piece if this is a rerun. The die or dies, and stock for the complete run. Now is also a good time to look over the die, stock, and artwork to get a sense of the challenges you'll face in a particular project. For instance, the textured stock for this job will show bruises more than a plain stock would and we'll need to be especially careful when carving around the hairs of the figure's head. The size and type of stock will also tell you what type of suckers to use on the feeding arm, the length and type of sheet holder tongue you'll need, and which die cutting plate to install. With a very heavy stock, you may need to switch from the standard 1 8 inch plate to a thinner die cutting plate. Now, we turn to the press itself. We spoke of the importance of using the highest quality materials to do first-rate work. With a Kluge press, you're using the highest quality press as well. You'll get the most from your materials and press by making sure the press is in perfect working order before beginning each run. So now we inspect and lubricate the press. You should, of course, routinely clean off the dust, paper, oil, and chad that collect on any press. Assuming you've done that, we just need to make sure the press is properly lubricated. Many Kluge presses, like the one we're using here, have an automatic oiling system. In that case, just prime the system at the start of each day and check the reservoir before each run. If your Kluge press requires manual lubrication, the oiling charts in your Kluge press operator's manual will show you exactly where to lubricate. Keep the charts close at hand until the procedure becomes second nature. Once that's done, we have to move, or in some cases remove, some of the press machinery so that we have easy access to the platen and chase, and so that the press is ready to accept a new job. First, we move the magazine out of the way. To do that, just lift the lock handle and swing the magazine to the right. 
Now, slide the magazine side guides all the way over so they're ready for any size stock. With the magazine out of the way, we can lock back the delivery arms. Then we can swing the delivery arms up to their raised position on our right. We'll need the feeding arm out of the way as well. To do that, first lock the feed head eccentric into the lock pin. Then swing the feeding arm up over the top until it rests on the feeding arm stop bracket. Now we just have to clear the platen and we're all set. First, use the 5 8 inch wrench to unbolt the grippers. Then take off the sheet holder tongue. We remove the side register gauge assembly by loosening the side register eye bolt nut. Then by loosening the tension screw, we can remove the bottom gauge band and the bottom band blocks. And that completes stage two. Now we have easy access to the platinum chase. We're ready to mount the die onto the toggle base and the toggle base onto the bed. And if we need to, we can change the die cutting plate now as well. Of course, we have to be sure that the die is positioned properly on the base. The easiest and most foolproof way of doing that is by creating a positioning sheet. The positioning sheet is a piece of stock for this run that has a hole cut out at the exact location of the image to be embossed. It's used first to position the die and later on to position the stock on the platen. We make the positioning sheet by measuring the exact location of each image on the artwork. Then mark the measured locations on a piece of stock. And using a make ready knife, cut out a hole of the proper size, shape and location for the image. Finally, we lay the sheet over the artwork to make sure our cuts are accurate. Now, place the positioning sheet on the toggle base. Line it up squarely with the base's edge and tape it to the base along the bottom edge. Use the positioning sheet as a guide for the die. Then flip it back out of the way while we attach the die to the base. The different size toggle hooks let us attach the die exactly where we want it. Don't lock them tight yet though. Square the die with the edge of the toggle base. Flip back the positioning sheet for a final check. Now fully tighten the hooks, locking the die onto the toggle base. Remove the positioning sheet and set it aside for later. Installing the toggle base is quick and easy. Set the toggle base onto the bottom chase stops of the hot plate. Slide it all the way to the right. Use the Allen wrench to tighten the side stop screw part way. Lock in the chase hook. Then tighten the side stop screw the rest of the way. If a job involves very thick stock, you may want to replace your standard 1 8 inch die cutting plate with a thinner one. 1 16th inch or for very heavy stock, 1 32nd inch. To change the die cutting plate, just unscrew the four corner screws. Lift the plate off the platen and screw in the new plate. Make sure the bearer pads you've made for the new plate are the right thickness. The thinner the plate, the thicker the pads have to be. We can test that by turning the flywheel by hand until the side arm is directly through the main shaft of the press. That's dead center on impression. At that point, the bearer pad should just meet the brass bearers on the toggle base. If they don't, then change the pads. The last task of stage three is setting the temperature for embossing. We may need to adjust it later, but 225 degrees is a good starting temperature. Now we come to what is perhaps the most critical stage and the one that's most likely to bring out the artisan in you, creating the counter die. 
The counter die is made up of three layers, a gray board attached to the platen, a molded counter die, and a capping board. We begin then by attaching the gray board to the platen. We have to be sure that the board is directly opposite the die, but that's easily accomplished. Cover one side of the gray board with Duplofold double-sided tape and remove the tape backing. Then tape the gray board onto the die with the Duplofold facing out. Now pull the manual impression knob out and turn the flywheel by hand all the way through one impression. The gray board is now firmly attached to the platen directly opposite the die. Take the mylar release film we cut earlier and tape it along one edge onto the gray board. Then flip it back. Now the gray board is ready to receive the compound. To make the compound, Fill one disposable cup with counter dye liquid and one with an equal amount of counter dye powder. Pour the powder into the liquid and mix the compound thoroughly. After you've done this a few times, you'll get a feel for whether the mixture is the right consistency and for whether you've made enough to completely cover the gray board without having a lot left over. Pour the counter dye compound onto the gray board and spread it evenly over the surface with the cleanup knife. Then flip the release film back over the board. Some pressmen use a nonstick spray on the die instead, especially for very intricate dies. But for most jobs, film works fine. Now turn the flywheel by hand until the press is closed dead center on impression. Be sure to turn the flywheel slowly enough to squeeze out all the air bubbles between the film and the compound. Keep the press on impression for five to seven minutes to give the compound time to dry. When time's up, turn the flywheel by hand until the press is open. Lift off the release film and cut and peel off the excess counter material with a cleanup knife. Now we're ready for the third and final layer of the counter die, the capping board. Cover one side of the board with make ready glue. Then place the board over the counter die, glue side down. Close the gain the start button. Run through impression several times. Then push in the stop button, leaving the press in the open position. Now wait several minutes for the glue to dry. We now have an exact male counterpart of the female die. But the counter die may not completely bottom out on portions of the image we want to emboss. At the same time, it may impress parts of the stock that we don't want to emboss. That is, it may be bruising the stock. To take care of both problems, we're going to carve away all of those portions of the counter die that are not raised. That way, the parts that are raised will come in full contact with the die, and we avoid bruising by the other portions. First, spray the capping board lightly with water to raise the grain, and run the press through impression again. When the heated impression dries the board, we're left with a sharpened image Carpenters use a similar technique for final sanding of wood furniture. Now, take the make-ready knife and cut away all those sections of the capping board that we don't want to emboss the paper. As we cut, it's a good idea to run the press through impression every once in a while to smooth down the cut edges. Once we're finished carving, tape a test paper over the capping board and run the press through impression once. We put on our optivisor and examine the test sheet for bruises, shine around bevels, and so on. Once we get exactly the image we want, attach a cover sheet of bond paper over the counter die with masking tape. Close the gate and push in the start button. 
go through a single impression to emboss the cover sheet. Then push the manual impression knob in. Even the sharpest embossing image is no good if it shows up in the wrong place on the stock. So now we position the stock for the press run. To make sure our image is properly positioned, we take out the positioning sheet we created earlier. By taping the reversed positioning sheet over the counter die, we know exactly where on the platen the stock has to land. Now we'll install the guides and gauges to fit that sheet. First, we line up the bottom gauge band and blocks with the bottom edge of the positioning paper. Once we've got it in the right position, we tighten the bottom gauge band bracket tension screw. We have to be sure that the brass bearers on the toggle base aren't hitting the bottom gauge band or interfering with the paper or guides. The bearer pads on the platen should tell us that. If there is a problem, move the brass bearers on the toggle base and the bearer pads on the platen so they're out of the way. Next, we attach the side guide assembly. By turning the gripper cam circle, which moves the gripper bar, we can determine exactly where the side guide should be. If the guide is on the operator's side, it should be slightly away from the paper. That lets the new sheet slide in without hitting it. Once it's positioned properly, tighten the side register eye bolt nut. We'll need an actual sheet of the stock in place to install the tongue and grippers. So take out the positioning sheet and put in a new sheet according to the bottom and side guides. By the way, save the positioning sheet. You can use it for any reruns of the job. To install the tongue, just loosen the screw, slide the tongue in, and tighten the screw. Make sure your sheet holder tongue is the right length for the job. It has to be off the sheet when the side register starts to move. And if you're using coated stock, the tongue should have a plastic tip. Then set the tongue pressure by bending the tongue. If there's not enough pressure, the sheet will bounce against the bottom gauge band. Too much pressure, and the sheet can't slide into place. Now install the grippers. Depending on the size and location of the image, we may need to add gripper fingers. Be sure they clear the image area again by turning the press by hand on impression. Now with all the guides in place, we're ready to test the position of our image. Close the gate and push in the start button. Go through a single impression. Push the manual impression knob in. Now check the position of our image against the original artwork. If it isn't an exact match, reposition the guides. And we're ready to set up the press for the actual run. Setting up the press just reverses what we did back at stage two. The difference is that as we put everything back into place, we have to adjust each component for this particular run. We'll begin by putting the feeding arm back in place. Swing down the feeding arm. Then unlock the feeding arm eccentric, making sure to hold on to the actuating rod so it doesn't slam into operating position. Attach the suckers appropriate to this run stock. Now bring the arm down to the bottom of the sheet near the gauge blocks. Line up and evenly space the suckers. Turn the flywheel through impression to make sure that the feeding arm and suckers clear the counter die and the bottom guides. Turn the press by hand again until the feeding arm sucker tips are at the bottom of the sheet. With a pencil, mark the location of the sucker closest to us on the sheet. That mark will help us line up the magazine in a moment. Next, position the delivery arms. Gently swing them down into operating position. Release the delivery lock, being sure to hold back on the delivery arms while you unlock it. Turn the flywheel by hand until the delivery arms are over the platen. Now adjust the delivery height and parallel adjustment screws so that the delivery arm suckers don't scuff or leave marks on the paper. 
and so the delivery arms don't interfere with the gripper arms. With the feeding arm and delivery arms in position, we can set up the magazine. Swing the magazine into place. Put the marked sheet into the magazine. We turn the flywheel by hand until the feeding arm goes as far as it will into the magazine. Then we crank the magazine handle until the sheet is within about an eighth of an inch of the feeding arm. Now slide the paper until our pencil mark lines up with the end sucker. Then slide the magazine side rails to fit that position. Lower the magazine back plate to its lowest position and load the magazine with stock for this run. Once it's loaded, crank the magazine back plate up until the stock is about an inch from the sucker tips. We actually want the stock to end up about a quarter inch from the sucker tips. We bring it up the rest of the way by adjusting the stock sensor arm. To do that, push the start button in and start up the press. Turn the adjusting knob on the stock sensor arm until it brings the paper up to about a quarter inch from the sucker tips. During the press run, the magazine blower pipes will push the top sheet out the rest of the way to meet the feeding arm. We can control the placement of the pipes to suit the stock width, as well as their angle and the force of the air blast. With the press still running, turn the vacuum pump switch on. Now that we can see where the air blasts are going, we can adjust the pipes left to right, front to back, and for strength of airflow. Once we've got it set, we pull out the feed without impression cable and the feed cable to check that paper is being properly fed. As the paper lands in the delivery, we adjust the delivery side guides to fit the stock size. Stop the press and push all cables in. Now everything's ready for our final run through and adjustments. We'll perform a single impression and carefully inspect the results. Start the press. Start the vacuum pump. Pull out the feed cable for a single impression. Then immediately push in the feed cable. Let's check the image for position and quality. We're really looking for everything at this point. Is the image sharp and clear? Are there any bruises on the image? Is it in exactly the right position? Are there any scuffs or sucker marks on the paper? If everything isn't just right, we go back and make whatever adjustments are needed. We've already seen how to make most of those adjustments, but there is one common solution to a common problem we should examine. When the image isn't sharp enough, we could lengthen the impression time or raise the temperature. But a better first solution is to insert packing material between the platen and the die cutting plate. That gives us a harder impression by raising the height of the entire counter die. To insert the packing, we first swing open the magazine. Then loosen the top two die cutting plate screws. Insert the screwdriver under the die cut plate to hold it open and insert the packing. The packing material can be almost any paper or board stock. Exactly how much to insert is a matter of trial and error. To avoid any damage to the press, it's always better to put in too little packing and then add as needed. Now, tighten the screws back down. Close the magazine and make another test impression. Once everything on the test sheet looks just right, the make ready is complete and we can begin the run. Of course, always check the results periodically throughout the run. And that's a blind embossing make ready. But what happens when we add foil to the process? Well, most important, we add a whole new spectrum of effects we can achieve on paper. Foils offer an incredible variety of colors and finishes from dazzling metallics, to subtle pastel tints, to bold matte pigments. Combine them with various embossing techniques, 
and the possibilities are limitless. That's what foils add to the impact of the finished product. But what do they add to your work as a pressman? How do they change the make-ready process? The first and most obvious difference is that you'll be loading rolls of foil onto the press. You'll find that to be a simple process easily learned. The real difference is in the creation of the counter die. Combination stamping and flat stamping each has its own special counter die techniques. The die for combination stamping looks like the one for a blind emboss, but it has to perform a much trickier job. That's because the embossing edge has to be sharp enough to cut and separate the foil from the roll, but not go so deep that it cuts the stock as well. Creating a counter die that perfectly matches the combination die can be a real test of the pressman's art. For flat stamping, since there is no sculptured surface, the carved three-layer counter die is replaced with a phenolic board and spot sheet. Now, let's take a look at the combination and flat stamping make-readies. Since you now understand the basic make-ready process, we'll focus on those steps that are different from a blind emboss make-ready. We'll examine the combination stamping make-ready first, even though it's the rarer and trickier of the two, because the basic counter die technique is so similar to the one we've just learned. Remember that the first stage of a make ready is to assemble your materials. Since we're adding foil, that first stage marks our first difference. Besides the materials for an embossing make ready, we'll need the rolls of foil for the job and a foil cutter to cut them to size. To cut the foil, first measure the width of the die that the foil will be used on. The foil should be a bit wider than the image. Now, mount the foil on the spindle of the foil cutter. Measure for the location of the cut and move the blade to that spot. Start the motor and make your cut. The second and third stages, clearing the press and setting up the platen and chase, are exactly the same as for a blind embossing make ready. The fourth stage, creating the counter die, begins the same, but we add a step as soon as the gray board has been attached to the platen. With combination stamping, we have to be sure that the die creates a sharp outer edge so that the foil gets properly cut when it goes through impression. To help make sure that happens, we're going to make a test impression onto the gray board. Now, check the gray board to see if the impression is visible. Can't clearly see its outline, then you'll need to raise the surface of the gray board by adding packing under the die cutting plate. Then you can go on and make the counter die. Once you've peeled off the excess with your cleanup knife, though, we're going to add another step that will also help to give us that sharp edge we need. With your make-ready knife, cut away the counter die material right up to the edge of the impression, the way you would carve the capping board for an embossing counter die. From there, finish making and carving the counter die exactly as you would for a blind emboss. And that completes stage four. The next stage is positioning the stock. But for combination stamping, we're also going to set up the foil now. Foil stamping requires a higher temperature than embossing. So the first thing we do once the counter die is complete is to turn up the temperature setting. 260 degrees or even a bit higher is about right. Now we're ready to load the foil onto the press. First, place each foil web onto one of the three rollers on the spool rack and position it over the die. If you're using more than one web, Place the foil for the tallest die onto the bottom roller. That's because the draw for each web is adjustable for the die height, and the web with the longest draw belongs on the bottom roller. Thread the foil through the pull rollers. Your Kluge press operator's manual has a threading diagram you can refer to until you've got the hang of it. Now, wrap the end of the foil around the rewind core. Next. Measure the height of the die image area for the foil on the bottom roller. 
The innermost chain fixture on the drive bracket controls the draw rate for the bottom roller. Set it to correspond to the measurement you just took. If you have webs on the other two rollers, repeat the process for each of them. The last step in setting up the foil is to align the air blast nozzles. Airflow from these nozzles helps separate the foil from the paper after each impression. You can move the nozzles by first loosening the Allen set screw on the set collar. Center each nozzle over its foil web and adjust the angle of each blast so that it's parallel to the bed. Once the nozzles are in place, tighten back the Allen set screw. You can also control the strength of the airflow. The flow should be strong enough to lift the foil from the paper without making it billow out. Each nozzle has an airflow pressure valve that controls the flow. For now, open each valve one full turn. Later on, when you make a test impression, you can fine tune the flow if you need to. The rest of the make ready, positioning the stock and setting up and running the press is the same as for blind embossing. When checking your final test impressions though, examine them for foil coverage and sharpness of edge as well as for the quality and position of the image. Finally, we come to flat stamping. The real change here is in the creation of the counter die. There are some differences when we first assemble materials though. As with combination stamping, we'll need to start by cutting foil to size for the job. And there are a few other changes in materials. That's because the three layer counter die we created for embossing and combination stamping isn't needed here. So instead of the gray board, capping board and counter die materials, we use a piece of phenolic board cut large enough to cover the image area, some bond paper for a spot sheet to cover the board, and some very thin paper we'll use to build up any portions of the image that the foil isn't covering properly. You can use calibrated packing paper for this. It's available in thicknesses ranging from 10 thousandths of an inch to as thin as 2 thousandths of an inch. Or you can use any other paper of comparable thickness. The second make ready stage, clearing the press, is performed just as for the other make readies. And the only change in stage three, setting up the platen and chase, is that we set the temperature higher than for embossing. Set it to about 250 degrees, again because of the higher temperature requirements for foil. But when we come to stage four, creating the counter die, the process changes completely. Begin stage four by loading the foil onto the press. Unlike combination stamping, we'll need the foil in place before we make the counter die. The foil is loaded in the same manner as for combination stamping. You place the foil webs on the rack, thread them through the rollers, set the draw for each web, and align the air blast nozzles. Next, we attach the phenolic board to the platen. Then, once it's positioned, tape the board with masking tape along one edge. Now, tape the spot sheet along one edge over the phenolic board, so that later, we can flip the phenolic board over the spot sheet. With the spot sheet in position, we can make our first test impression. It will show us whether we need to adjust the airflow from the foil air blast unit and whether we need to adjust the counter die to improve foil coverage. Watch the foil while it goes through impression. If it needs it, adjust the airflow by turning the valve. Now check the image on the spot sheet. If the entire impression is too light, first check the temperature to make sure it's reached the temperature you set. If that's not the problem, then raise the counter die by inserting packing material under the die cutting plate. If individual portions of the impression are too light, we'll need to raise them selectively. That's where our calibrated paper comes in. Attach pieces of the paper directly onto the spot sheet wherever the image is too light. You can just tape the paper on if you can place the tape out of the way of the die. Or if that's not possible, just wet the paper and stick it on. Now, lift up the spot sheet by its hinge. Lift up the phenolic board, 
lay the spot sheet under the board and tape a new spot sheet over the board. Now make another test impression and check again for foil coverage. Repeat the process until you get the total coverage you want. Once that's done, you've created the counter die. The next stage is positioning the stock. Place the positioning sheet so that its holes line up with the appropriate images on the spot sheet. Then install the guides and grippers. Position the gripper arms and fingers closer to the image area than you would for embossing. That way, they'll help separate the foil web from the paper after each impression. The rest of the make ready is exactly the same as for embossing. You've now been introduced to the make ready process. The reference guide that accompanies this tape will help walk you through your first practice make readies for blind embossing, combination stamping, and flat stamping. It will also help you to think of the process in terms of the six stages we've described here. Assembling materials, clearing the press, setting up the platen and chase, creating the counter die, positioning the stock, and setting up and running the press. With practice, you'll gradually develop the skills and knowledge and the imagination and craftsmanship of a true artisan. And then you'll know the real joy of being a pressman. <laughs>